This episode and all episodes of the Bloodstream Podcast is brought to you exclusively by Shire. To find out more about Shire's commitment and resources for the bleeding disorders community, visit bleedingdisorders.com. And as always, for their support, we say thank, thank you, Shire. Shire. Hello, and welcome to the Bloodstream Podcast, episode 22, March 19th, 2018. I am Patrick James Lynch. And I'm Natalie Lynch. On this episode, community member Kevin Krivasik shares his journey toward independence in a piece titled Third Times a Charm. Camp Casey founder and executive director Molly Reeser joins us to discuss the camp's mission and her inspiration for starting it. And Natalie guides us through a new Forbes magazine piece highlighting one of the many challenges in mental health treatment. All that, plus using a combination of written statements, audio recordings, and his own original writing, we say goodbye to community leader Barry Hardy, who passed away late last month at the age of 52. All that and more coming up on this episode. Welcome to Bloodstream. March 19th. Natalie, did you know that today, uh, this episode's coming out on March 19th, episode 22, and episode 21 came out on February 19th. Did you know that? I, well, I mean, I recorded it, so I, I do know that, and I, you know, I, I like to promote do it on my social media page, that. but I didn't it's do the, the 19th, correlation. Well, it's pretty exciting. Isn't that yeah. amazing? I'm sure our listeners are ready for more excitement. Yeah, all the, that's what we're <laughs> leading with, so you know it's a good episode when we're leading by just telling you about the date over and over again. 19th Wow, well, yeah, February's 28 days. That's how that works, Patrick. Four weeks exactly. Um, no, it's a cool, it's a cool thing. Yeah, a I don't think fact. it's ever happened before. It is Bleeding Disorders Awareness Month. Um, it is a big month. There's a lot of, online about the community. The Washington Days took place this month. You may have seen also NHF's Red Tie campaign or HFA's Facts of the Day, which are really, really cool if you're following the HFA Facebook page. Tell you about a couple things that are, are going on here. As always, there's a lot going on with Bloodstream Media. Later this month, Ask the Expert host Chris Bombardier will release his second episode as the host. Uh, February 26th, that episode comes out. And Heather Robb debuted as the host of the Powering Through podcast on its latest episode, which went live on February 5th and sounded excellent. And uh, lastly, you've heard us talk about our Bloodline podcast series before, the three-episode deep dives into the topics that matter most. Well, this month, we're releasing a brand new Bloodline series, our Hemophilia and Young Adulthood Roundtable, recorded live with members of the Hemophilia Association of New Jersey. Uh, Natalie and I played the uh, the co-hosts, co-moderators to that conversation, which I found to be really interesting. So did I. Yeah, it's definitely worth a listen. So earlier this month, we released part one uh, with uh, the central themes for that being identity, transitions, and disclosure. We also released part two uh, just last week, which was about pushing limits, emotional support, and pain management and substance abuse. And part three, which will go up tomorrow, March 20th. And you know that's tomorrow, March 20th because we've established pretty well by now. Today is March 19th. <laughs> uh, March 20th, uh, that Episode part three is on dating and relationships, intimacy, and hope. It was a really uh, interesting evening, and I think these have turned out very well. Uh, a lot of talk about young adults with hemophilia and uh, why, more conversations needed around the topics that are on their minds. And I think we did a good job of uh, bringing together a group of eight people and presenting them with the opportunity to talk about these things. So um, to find that series, search Bloodline Podcast in iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts, or visit bloodstreammedia.com where you'll find links to stream or subscribe to all of Bloodstream Media's podcasts for the bleeding disorders community. Okay, our next segment, Community News in 60 Seconds. We debuted this last month. It is what it sounds like. Natalie and I will read headlines, community news, but we only have 60 seconds to do so. Nat, why do you look so concerned already? We haven't even started yet. Because I think we need the, the countdown one. Oh, the countdown one. Okay, because yeah, I have the keep... stopwatch open. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. that's fair. You you looked terrified. I uh, know. I, I Wow. Uh, no, it's fair. I appreciate you your attention. You have to have the tech ready. <laughs> Thanks for looking out for the tech, Natalie. <laughs> Now, have you all know that Natalie and I did just do a round of community news in 60 seconds, but we weren't very pleased with how it went. We could have gone better. It definitely could have gone better. So we're going to try it again. I, okay. Win, lose, or draw. I need confidence from you right now. I'm not. I'm sensing like a lot of non-confidence. Okay. I'll get confident. When? Right now. I, that was my confidence face. Well, then community news okay. in 60 seconds begins. 
now. From Athens to Atlanta, from San Diego to City, people across the globe marked World Rare Disease Day on February 20th in a variety of fun, creative ways. The goal to raise awareness about the 7,000 or so known rare diseases, 95% of which have few treatments or no cures. Great start. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute will host their State of Science workshop on Factor 8 inhibitors May 15th and 16th in Bethesda, Maryland. The workshop will center around community-wide input into the development of future research on Factor 8 immunogenicity and Factor 8 inhibitor prevention and eradication. A Phase 1-2 clinical trial on the SBF9, an investigative gene editing therapy for hemophilia V is now authorized to enroll adult and adolescent patients in the UK. Approval from the UK's Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency will make the first genome editing study conducted in Europe. First one cool thing, the European Commission has approved Hemlibra for routine preventative treatment of bleeding episodes in people who have hemophilia A with factor 8 inhibitors. Shire Korea, re Shire Korea recently <laughs> received approval from South Korea's Ministry of Food and Drug Safety, Dynavate, long-lasting factor Eight recombinant therapy for hemophilia A. Four seconds of loctate uh, use and immune tolerance induction therapy shows promise for high-risk patients with severe hemophilia A. Positive. That was good. That was better. That was better. That was pretty good. All right. So you know what? There you go. There's what, what do you got? Well, I feel like we could do even better. Oh my goodness. You do? Well, I don't know. We almost got through the end. We did. But they could go to the program notes to read the rest. There you go. So if, if you didn't hear a thing we said or if you want to see what we missed, uh, check out the program notes for links to everything we did and did not get to in Community News in 60 Seconds. Kicking off the like, share, comment segments for this month, as always, is Natalie with our like segment. Natalie, what do you got for us? I have a, a recent Forbes article called Psychiatrist Shortage Escalates as U.S. Mental Health Needs Grow. So what's it say? Um, so um, interestingly is psychiatrists are the second most uh, recruited doctor after family physicians, which is interesting. The second most recruited by... By, by patients? Yeah, patients hmm. seeking a physician. Uh, a, I didn't know that. Yeah, they were, um, a decade ago, they were ninth on the list, and now they are second. Whoa. Yeah, so they've they've really moved up, which I think the stigma of mental health has shifted or started to shift. I mean, that seems pretty dramatic to go from ninth to second on the list. I think that would suggest that the stigma around mental health has reduced, that people are at the very seeking. least seeking it. Probably the availability of the internet makes it easier to seek out what the options are than once upon a time. But nonetheless, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so that probably means there's plenty of psychiatrists to go around, right? They're so in demand that there must be loads of them, right, now. Well, there's 28,000 psychiatrists in the U.S., which feels really low. Yeah, so uh, what quick math here tells us that, that is one psychiatrist uh, for every 12,857 people. Yeah, they. I mean, they should have really full patient loads. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would imagine so. Um, but that number is dwindling rapidly because the psychiatrists are aging. The article states that three in five psychiatrists um, in practice are currently over the age of 55. Three. So 60% of psychiatrists 60%, are yes. over 55. Yes. Do we have a lot of psychiatrists in school or what, what, the bottom's going to drop out of that? Well, the maintains. AAMC said medical schools and teaching hospitals are doing their part, citing that there's been a 5% increase in psychiatry residents from 2010 to 2015. Okay. Um, but educators say there's more to be done. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Um, and then there was an interesting paragraph in the article talking about... Um, why you know there's there's the shortage the aging psychiatrists but that uh, while other medical specialties such as cardiology and orthopedic surgery offer health care providers a profit center based care where patient illnesses can be treated with medical procedures or tangible interventional care mental health coverage often requires long-term management without a defined cure that often is not profitable mm. thus mental health care is not a desirable service line for many hospitals and other providers, as are the other specialties. So once again, that profit motive comes in as uh, an underlying cause of a problem that we're presenting here. Yeah, so um, it's it, it's definitely a problem. I know that there's uh, a couple things in government that are happening to help with physician shortages in general, but mm. not necessarily um, psychiatrists. Uh, Chuck Schumer of New York um, pushed uh, was pushing a 15,000 residency position um, under the so-called Physician Shortage Act of 2017. A 15,000, what is that? To add 15,000 residency positions. Oh, with, in the state yeah, of New York. In New York. 
Hmm. So, and and that's called the Physician Shortage Act of 2017. So that should help this. And that, that's something that, that's passed? Um, he is... Uh, or he's lobbying for it currently. He's pushing. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so. yeah. Keep pushing, Chuck. <laughs> Okay. But yeah, so I mean that'll help um, in general, and hopefully some of those fifteen thousand uh, choose psychiatry. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, when that profit motive is an underlying factor within the healthcare system, I mean that's that just that 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 paragraph you read makes a great point that it, it's long term management often with no uh, discernible cure. Right. Um, so that's challenging. Uh, now, the one thing that sticks out before we sum up uh, and move on here, was there any reference to, does the shortage have anything to do, um, according to the article, with uh, a rise in other clinicians who work within mental health, like psychologists or other mental health providers? No, the article specifically talks about psychiatrists, uh, not psychologists or social workers. Okay. And psychiatrists are the only um, providers that can prescribe medicine. Right. That Yeah, that's true. So I guess in the most severe or significant cases, it's psychiatry is the, probably the most often the route to go and that shortage is going to be most felt. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for presenting that. Not exactly. What do we do? What do we do about this? I don't know, but it's it's good to, to think about. And, you know, if you're considering medical school, consider... Uh... If you or someone you know is considering <laughs> medical school, shove them aggressively towards psychiatry. Yes, if they, we need you. If they are resistant to it, that's okay. They can talk to a colleague about it. And get they can talk to a psychiatrist. Yeah, exactly. It'll be fine. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. You're welcome. And now for this month's share segment, it comes to us from Kevin Krivisek, who shares his story of life with severe hemophilia A and his journey toward independence in a piece he's titled Third Time's a Charm. Here's Kevin. Third Time's a Charm. My name is Kevin Krivisek, and I have severe hemophilia A. I am 24 years old and live in Elgin, Illinois. Currently, I'm in my second year of teaching band and orchestra to fifth grade students at two elementary schools. Becoming a music teacher was a life goal of mine from a young age, but without the confidence I gained from learning to self-infuse, I would not have been able to accomplish this goal. Here is my story. Life at home was different for us than your average American family. My parents have been divorced ever since I can remember, and it was difficult not seeing my dad a lot. My older brother and I both have hemophilia, and my brother is on the autism spectrum. Great mix, right? My mom was a neonatal intensive care unit nurse for the longest time and worked part-time in order to take care of my brother and I. Luckily, with her being a nurse, infusions at home were easy because she could access the vein like a professional. Let me tell you, she was a professional. My dad knew how to infuse my brother and I as well. When I was around seven, our hematologist decided that my brother and I should start prophylaxis. My parents tried their best to be consistent with profi treatment, but since both of them were working single parents, it was a challenge. I was curious to learn about self-infusion so I could take the burden off of them and be in control of my own care. Then, around 9 or 10, I went to hemophilia camp through the Hemophilia Foundation of Illinois. It was a great opportunity to run around and be a kid and also learn self-infusion in a safe environment with medical staff around. I remember the first time I hit the vein. I felt very accomplished and proud that I would be able to be more self-sufficient. Fast forward about two months. I had been self-infusing here and there with the help from my parents. I was at a family friend's house and wanted to show off that I could self-infuse. My mom, family friend, and I sat at the kitchen table ready to rock and roll. I put the tourniquet on and was able to see the vein. I stuck myself and got some drawback, so I was feeling pretty confident. After a few seconds, it was challenging to push the medicine through. Being a 10-year-old with little experience, I didn't think anything of this and kept pushing factor. After about 15 seconds, I felt horrible pain in the top of my hand and saw a bubble. I kid you not, I screamed in panic and pain and wanted everything to stop. My mom took the needle out and gave me a huge hug as I cried, feeling terrified. She explained to me what infiltration was and that the bump was factor under my skin. It was nothing to worry about and would go away in a day or two. After that incident, I never wanted anything to do with self-infusing again. I was terrified of sticking myself. And for the next seven years, my mom, hematologists, nurse practitioners, and my dad tried to convince me to attempt self-infusing again. They said my life would be way more independent, but I didn't want to listen. I became a teenager who had to rely on his parents to infuse him. I remember sitting on my mom's bed with her as a frustrated 17-year-old, soon to be high school senior. I was still terrified of the thought of self-infusion. What would happen if I infiltrated again? Will this just keep happening? What if I can't hit the vein? 
As you can imagine, these thoughts and many more were running through my head. The thought of moving away to college kept itching at my brain. <laughs> my mom said to me, I guess I'll have to move to college with you so I can give you factor. What would all of your friends think? We both laughed, but I knew my mom was frustrated because she knew I was capable of self-infusing. My anxieties and fears were just getting in the way. So that day, with the help of my mom and some positive self-talk, I took the risks I had been afraid to take for seven years, and I hit the vein. The moment that I got drawback, I felt a rush of relief and freedom. It was a very cleansing feeling. I knew that I was starting the journey into adulthood. Little did I know that I would soon feel comfortable moving away to college to pursue my dream of becoming a music teacher. Throughout college, there were many struggles with hemophilia. Lots of bleeding episodes, issues ordering factor, and finding time to self-infuse with the busy schedule of a music education major. This included concert band rehearsals, marching band rehearsals, teaching observations, countless hours in the practice room, oh, and don't forget finding time to study for my academic courses. Luckily, I was able to navigate many of these challenges thanks to the independence given to me by self-infusion. Self-infusing has helped me become the person who I am today and achieve many of my life goals. So if anyone hearing this is starting self-infusion and struggling, know that you are not alone. This is no small challenge to overcome. In fact, this was probably one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life. You will do it at some point. Know that. Make sure you have tons of support from family and your doctors. If you mess up, just try again. You can do it. It is definitely worth it. And that's a promise. Thank you, Kevin, for sharing Third Time's a Charm, uh, which, by the way, you can find in written form along with all of our previous share segment contributions um, at bloodstreampod.com backslash blog, the blog page for the Bloodstream Pod website if you want to read Kevin's piece, Third Time's a Charm. You know what jumps out to me, Natalie, from that is thinking about uh, on paper, you have severe hemophilia. It means this. It means that. You take this medication. You can live a really full life. But as we know well from our relationship with Chris Bombardier and is is profiled in the documentary coming out later this year, for all of the um, the kind of highlight points of someone who has hemophilia, the simple act of having to infuse it is really challenging. I mean, I have my issues around it. Chris has his. Kevin shared his struggles. Uh, it's not like, yes, it's fundamentally easy. But psychologically, mentally, emotionally, talking about mental health earlier, it's it's much more than can meet the eye for some people, for some people. And anyway, that's what jumps out to me. What from this kind of stood out to you? Well, I just thought like the general, obviously I've never infused, um, so I don't, I don't know what that feels like, but the being- Yeah, but you would probably like it because you're that I'm kind a weirdo, of person. Yeah, but- <laughs> your word, not mine. <laughs> um, but just thinking of like uh, his 10 year old self and mm-hmm. that- I'm I'm sure anyone who listens to this story can relate to something that they had a little anxiety about and then something didn't go terribly right with it and so they just wrote it off. Mm-hmm. But but it came up again maybe before going to college or maybe early adulthood or maybe when they became a parent like right. those things come back. Yeah. So it you know even though it's very specific to infusion and hemophilia I I felt like okay like I I know. Yeah. I know yeah. what you're talking about. So yeah, it's kind of a grown up thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's part of coming of age with hemophilia. Uh, and as Kevin said at the end of the piece, you can do it and it's definitely worth it. So to anybody out there who is uh struggling with self infusion or who has a kid who's currently struggling with it, uh it is worth it. It will happen and sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it takes a while. So thank you again, Kevin, for sharing that piece. And now for our comment segment this month, uh, titled simply Farewell, Barry Hardy. Um, I'm going to read uh, here what the National Hemophilia Foundation, um, well, I, I guess I should start by saying uh, Natalie and I attended the services for Barry in Houston uh, earlier this month. were hosted by Jorge and Debbie De La Riva in Houston, Texas. And thank you again to Debbie and to Jorge for hosting us and uh, got to see uh, the people who were down there for that, uh, Kimberly Hogstad. Um, from HFA, uh, uh, Paul Brayshaw, Vaughn Ripley, and, uh, Ray Diatoli, a lot of 
a lot of kind of usual suspects, so to speak, especially for that area of the country. Um, it was a beautiful service. Uh, it felt really appropriate. Some excellent uh, things that were said and shared. And, and that, um, along with just kind of generally wanting to do something to capture this moment and say goodbye to Barry in our own way, uh, kind of inspired this this bit. I do. I, I should say too before I kind of go on here. So I'm going to read a few statements from various organizations. Um, we have a few uh, uh, voicemails that we collected from community members. We're going to share a few of them uh, here as well. And then later on, actually, in the parting shots, I'm going to share something that Barry wrote. Um, but it, it's kind of long, so I'm going to leave that to the very end. Um, but just before I, I, I do get into this, I do want to acknowledge that Barry isn't the only community member. Um, who died suddenly and unexpectedly lately. Um, and unfortunately, we lose community members, you know, when we do. Um, so I do want to recognize that he's not the only one, but I do think that the amount of outpouring and um, sharing about Barry is suitable because he, quite frankly, did things no one else had ever done in our community. And uh, when people do those kind of things and they leave us, uh, unexpectedly and too early, it, it strikes a chord. Um, so I, I don't feel at all uh, embarrassed about uh, kind of going on about this particular individual. But I also do want to acknowledge that uh, Ron Bark passed away just before Barry did. A couple other guys I, I had heard about, I don't know who they are, but have, have recently passed as well. So um, just want to acknowledge that as I as I move on here. So here's the, the first statement from the National Hemophilia Foundation. It gives you a little background if you don't know anything about Barry. Barry was born with severe hemophilia A. He, along with his brother, was infected by HIV and hepatitis C in 1985 from contaminated factor. Barry's brother passed away in 2007 from liver failure from hepatitis C. It was partly this loss that inspired Barry to begin his cross-country cycling expeditions. Barry said, quote, I use the bike rides as a way to try to eliminate the stigma and misperceptions out there about HIV. In 2012, he began Wheels for the World, cross-country bike rides to raise money for Save One Life, which provides funds directly to people with bleeding disorders in developing countries. Barry rode cross-country each year and ultimately rode more than 63,000 miles and raised more than $220,000 for the organization. Barry was an inspirational figure to many for his indomitable spirit, his kindness, and his generosity. NHF extends its condolences to his friends and family and joins the community in mourning the loss of one of their champions. The Hemophilia Federation of America. With every mile he logged on his bicycle, Barry Hardy made each of us proud to call him our friend and blood brother. Through his Wheels for the World bike rides, Barry sought to raise awareness for the disparities in hemophilia care around the world and honored those who had lost the battles to HIV and AIDS or hepatitis C. Barry loved his family, his community, and jazz music. We'll miss his soothing baritone voice and gentle nature, but most of all, we'll miss our dear friend. Rest in peace, Barry. From Save One Life, we have lost a very, very great friend. Words cannot express our sadness that Barry's no longer here. Our gratitude to him for our wonderful and uplifting collaboration over the years knows no bounds. He broke physical boundaries and showed what is possible for a person living with hemophilia, inspiring thousands around the world. He helped Save One Life raise funds that allowed us to grow, add new programs, expand into new countries, and assist countless more children. It is hard to imagine the world, our world, without him. Ride well, Barry Hardy. The horizon ever stretches before you. And I want to now play for you some of those recordings that I mentioned. So these are from community members reflecting on their experience with Barry Hardy. My name is Priscilla Oren. I'm going to be brief on this because I'm in a great state of mourning over the loss of Barry. I was a very close friend of his, and we had an incredibly special relationship because I have a son who has severe hemophilia, and Barry became my mentor more than 11 years ago, and I was his first community sponsor on his very first bike ride, and I was at each one of his bike rides, the first community sponsor to save one life. Um, I can't speak enough about what he did for my life. I was able to share things with him that I could not share with other people about my son, and I am very grateful that he came into my life and gave me good advice. I also was a participant 
in the creation of the history room for the Hemophilia Federation, and that was through Barry. Hi, this is Angel Parrott. I had the opportunity to meet Barry twice, both times during the early fall of 2016. The first time, I took a road trip to catch up with him on that year's bike tour. I had completed hepatitis C treatment six weeks prior and was in my waiting time of determining if the cure had been successful. I pretty much surprised him, but he took time out of his schedule to meet with me and provide support. The second time was just over two months later. He had made a speaking trip, and I was there to hear him share his life story. That time, several other community members, as well as a room full of public health students, heard his personal account mixed in with the history of hemophilia treatment and how contaminated blood came about. I do not have the words to say just how much that time left an impression on me. Not only did I hear his presentation, I was able to spend the rest of that day with him and his host. Left an impact in more ways than one. He is just one of many who paved the way for me to enjoy improved treatment as a person with a rare disorder and just one of many who will inspire me to never give up hope for a better tomorrow, not just for myself, but for all of us. Hi, Patrick. This is Debbie Del Riva. Basically, I wanted to talk about, you know, how grateful I am that I crossed paths with Barry. And he, he really showed me the power of the power and the impact, you know, of living intentionally. Um, I remember Barry described it as um, he realized that he had more time than expected. So he decided to use it wisely, use it to benefit others. I guess the other thing is that um, really just knowing Barry made me uh, want to be a better person. This is Vaughn Ripley. Uh, obviously, everybody knows Barry was such an important guy in the community, but a lot of times I hear from folks, they didn't hear some of the sides of Barry that some of us have gotten to experience. So I wanted to share my uh, story that I had with him. When he got me first involved, and it was actually him, he was the primary driver in getting me back involved with the hemophilia community. But when he did, he also set me on a path where I was going to start doing inspirational speaking. And, you know, I was a little bit nervous about doing that, and Barry knew that, and we were at one of the events together, and he was sitting at a table with me, and it was a crowd of maybe about 250 people, so my nerves were going a little bit. I had the butterflies in the belly, which is standard fare, but at the same time, I feel like Barry knew exactly what to say. And the funny thing is, what he said sort of took me for a turn. And what he did was, just as I was getting introduced, and I was supposed to be heading up onto the stage to start kick my speech off, he leaned into me, and he quietly said, when you least expect it, I'm going to heckle you. And normally, I, you know, I mean, I kind of laugh at that kind of thing and stuff like that. And I would think that it was just somebody uh, offhandedly being funny. But I looked over at him with a smile on my face. And the funny thing is, he wasn't smiling back. He was looking back at me with a solid, stoic, berry look. And so as I stumbled up onto the stage, all I could think about was what Barry had said. And the funny thing is, it got rid of my butterflies. It got rid of all my worries about my speech. And I took the speech on with vim and vigor and was able to, to pull it off great. And I owe a lot of that to Barry. And yet, the funny thing is, it was like the whole time I was kind of peeking over at him just to see how he was responding or reacting or was he serious about what he was going to do. But it didn't matter. Barry knew exactly what I needed at that moment and he gave it to me and I've got dozens of those kinds of stories and that's the thing about Barry for me was that he was always there and always knew precisely what to say at the right time he was a magical person and I feel like it's very important for us not only to remember him but to continue in his honor to do things for the community that's our task now as we carry the torch the very heavy torch that Barry Hardy carried for us for years uh, so as I mentioned at the end of today's episode, uh, in, in my parting shot, I'm going to read for you something that Barry wrote that I don't think was ever published anywhere until uh, Lori Kelly recently published it, and it's quite beautiful. So uh, stick around to the end of the podcast to hear uh, some final words from Barry in a way, I suppose. Um, 
yeah so with that obviously that's a tough subject but we're going to put that to, to bed for the time being uh move on we have a great interview coming up with molly reeser founder and executive director of camp casey i'll tell you about that in just a moment after this quick word from shire Once again, we want to say thank you to our sponsor, Shire, for continuing to support this one-of-a-kind digital resource for the bleeding disorders community. Uh, bleedingdisorders.com is where you can find all of Shire's resources for the bleeding disorders community, resources such as a list of upcoming events. Um, let's see, what else we got here? The Education Advantage Scholarships Opportunity. Uh, find help starting or paying for your own treatment. Oh, that sounds like it might be interesting. If you can't tell, I'm actually currently perusing uh, bleedingdisorders.com myself. I'm going to click this word community. Let's see what's over here. Oh, I see something from the, the Teen Impact Awards. I'm a big fan of that. always like seeing that <laughs> up. Very good. Let's see. What is bleeding disorders advocacy? That's an important topic. Become a bleeding disorders advocate. I would Especially like to. Especially this month. And then find a Shire rep in your area. Yeah, if you have more questions about Shire or their products, you can find a Shire rep in their area. So there's a lot of stuff here on bleedingdisorders.com from Shire. Check that out. And once again, for their support, we like to say, thank, thank you, Shire. Shire. Molly Reeser is the founder and executive director of Camp Casey, a 501c3 nonprofit horseback riding organization for children with cancer, sickle cell anemia, and or aplastic anemia, and their families. Camp Casey has been featured on NBC's Today Show, written about nationally in the Huffington Post, Horse Illustrated, Chronicle of the Horse, and has received recognition in countless Michigan publications. It is a Michigan-based organization. While Camp Casey doesn't serve children or families affected by von Willebrand disease or hemophilia, they do serve children with sickle cell disease and their families. They are on the verge of a pretty interesting growth moment, which you're going to hear about here shortly. And I think it's important for our community to hear from leaders like Molly, who aren't necessarily serving our populations, but are serving populations similar enough to ours that they have insight and stories we can benefit from. So here it is, my interview with Molly Reeser, the founder and executive director of Camp Casey. Okay, so I am joined now by Molly Reeser. She is the founder and executive director of Camp Casey, a nonprofit horseback riding organization for children with cancer and rare blood disorders. Hi, Molly. How are you? Hi. Thank you so much for having me. So, Molly, I just gave that kind of one sentence description, but uh, give us a little bit more background. What is Camp Casey all about? Well, Camp Casey is now entering its 14th season. Um, I founded the program actually when I was a student at Michigan State University um, to honor a friend of mine. Um, the organization looked very differently then. Um, in fact, it wasn't an organization at all, but it was a one-day event to honor a young girl who did badly pass away from cancer. Um, but today we now operate up to about 1,600 participants each year through three uh, cost-free programs. Our programs include uh, ways to, to bring children and families and communities together with horses. So all of our programs include horseback riding or fun and respite that will help kids sort of be kids again while they're going through some pretty hard times. So we talk a lot in the hemophilia and VWD, greater bleeding disorders community, about the value of camp. But I'm struck by the specific emphasis on the value of that interaction with horses and with the animals and horseback riding. So can you speak a little further about what that specifically does to your campers, that interaction with the horses? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, horses are a very powerful animal. They are large and cumbersome and scary sometimes. And our our hope is that we can bring the horse together with the child um, and maybe even, you know, ignite a little bit of fear in the child at first because they're kind of scary and they're big and then show the child how they can control this animal and conquer his fear and get on that animal and learn how to control fear and stop and ride and um, care for this, you know, giant beast that can sometimes seem very overwhelming. But by the time that they are, you know, they're on the horse and feeling very empowered by the animal, they can then hopefully apply that to the hardships that they're going through. What is very unique about Camp Casey is that we actually bring camp to the homes of children who are too sick to attend camp. So oftentimes the struggles that the families are going through, whether it's, you know, their low blood count or a blood transfusion that they have to had recently endure or the chemotherapy that schedule that they are on, it really has, it robs the children of what we would consider a normal summertime experience. Um, while their peers are going off to summer camp or enjoying their summer programs, these are kids who are oftentimes homebound 
and don't really get to experience summer camp and make those memories with their friends like they should be able to. We bring the camp experience right to their door. We um, tailor the day around the child's treatment or summer schedule, and we show up to the doorstep, whether it's in the city or the suburbs or a rural area or a trailer park or an apartment complex, no matter where the child lives, we show up with a horse. And we bring the horse right to the doorstep. We knock on the door and the children of the household open the door and they're they're surprised, actually. <laughs> it's a, usually a complete surprise to find that there's a horse on their doorstep. Once, you know, they get over the shock and surprise of the horse on their doorstep, they are greeted by the volunteers to um, take them through an afternoon of camp-related activities, all at the comfort of home. Something else that I was struck with in um, watching some of the videos on on the Camp Casey website and, and reading up a little bit was the uh, the awareness of including the sibling or siblings um, in in the experience in some way. And I know that's something that is uh, often talked about in the bleeding disorders world and the camp world uh, on the bleeding disorder side of things, um, how often it's easy to overlook these siblings whose lives are dramatically affected in many cases by the diagnosis of the patient. Um, can you speak a little to that, how, how you've included the siblings in, in thinking about your programming? Of course. Well, you know, and this this kind of goes back to um, my experience knowing Casey, oh, about 15 years ago when she would come horseback riding and her brother would come along with her and, of course, didn't have any um, health issues that prohibited him from having the normalcy of a childhood, though his sister's illness, you know, did very much have an effect on him and rob him in many ways of what we would consider a normal childhood. And I saw that firsthand. And when Camp Casey started, it was always important to me that the siblings were a part of this experience because cancer and sickle cell disease and aplastic anemia or any health issue that a child is going through is not just an issue for that child. It it has an effect on the entire family. So our program from the very start has always had a um, had it a part of our mission that we are a family serving organization. You know, we we've heard from the parents and even seen firsthand that sometimes the siblings can act out in a little bit of jealousy. So we're really proud to know that our program comes in and makes the entire family feel special and feel whole. We make it a a real priority to include the sibling and make sure that they are a part of the of the fund just as the uh, qualifying child is. You had mentioned in that answer children with sickle cell anemia and aplastic anemia. Uh, so while while the camp does, from what I understand, primarily serve children with cancer, there are these other two diagnoses that you've just mentioned. Can um, What led you to expand the services to these other diagnoses? And have you noticed anything about what Camp Casey can offer those populations that's perhaps unique or different from what it's been offering the children with cancer? Yes. And thank you for asking that, because I think sometimes sickle cell disease and aplastic anemia, oftentimes, I mean, I've seen it, it's a very underserved population. While we were advertising our program on the different pediatric oncology hematology floors, which we were um, we we're noticing that we're putting posters up and handing out flyers to the medical staff of those who are sitting right next to somebody getting, you know, a bone marrow transplant or chemotherapy or, you know, they're, they're there for their treatment for cancer. And right next to them is a child going through um, a blood disease, going through treatment for sickle cell disease or aplastic anemia. We started um, not only seeing this firsthand, but also receiving applications from children who were in the hospital getting treated on the same floor as our cancer patients. They thought, hey, we want to go horseback riding too. We think that this sounds like a really great experience. They would apply for our program only to be told our program was only available to children with cancer. Well, there was a real problem with that because these children not only are going through just the most tremendous hardships, just like our cancer patients, but they're oftentimes receiving the same treatment. I approached our board and did a little bit of research, and it was a real no-brainer. I mean, it was a unanimous decision to open our parameters to serve that population. And that happened, oh, I would say about seven or eight years ago. And since then, um, it has been incredible to learn about these diseases that oftentimes don't get talked about, and they definitely don't get served the way that other diseases do, such as cancer. It's been a really wonderful experience to hear from some of the parents of our children with sickle cell disease and aplastic anemia, to hear them thank us for doing something for their child while there are so many other 
organizations out there that don't ha- have not yet recognized the importance of including this very um, underserved population. Admittedly, I, I know less about aplastic anemia than I do about uh, sickle cell anemia, but on the on the hemophilia von Willebrand dis- disease, greater bleeding disorders uh, from uh, from that POV. Likewise, sickle cell anemia kind of fits in this no man's land of where resources and organizations dedicated to serving those patients, where, where they come in. And so it's nice to hear that that recognition of, yeah, these are the same, these patients are sharing uh, uh, space in the hospital to get together. They're seeing what other patients may have offered to them. So it's it's encouraging to hear that Cam Casey recognized that and said, hey, we, we can do something about that. I want to go back and ask you about the founding of Camp Casey to begin with. Who was Casey Foote and why did your interaction with her uh, set you on a journey that, I mean, now, 50, I think you said 15 years later, I did you imagine when this was beginning, when, when you were at uh, uh, Michigan State University, that this was going to become uh, a part of your life's work? Or, or, or who was Casey and how did, how did this happen? <laughs> I think I was about 18 or 19 years old when I started working on a farm just outside of Lansing or East Lansing, um, where I went to school. And it was there that I met Casey. She was, oh, I want to say she was about 10 years old when we met. She was just a little thing. And she, from the start had a real impact on me because she was evidently sick. She didn't have her hair. You could tell she was going through chemotherapy. But Casey was the kind of young girl who just didn't want to hear anybody's sympathies. She would tell you to stop the waterworks if you even, you know, gave her any sort of look that that, that screamed that you felt sorry for her in any way because she just didn't want it. She was really sarcastic and funny and sweet and very into animals. I mean, this little girl loved animals and that's where the two of us really started our bond. As she got more sick, she spent less time at the barn and eventually she did about a year and a half after I got to know her, um, she passed away. It was devastating. I mean, it was, it was awful. It felt like something was missing at the barn because she wasn't there and she had come so often because it was, it truly was her escape from what she was going through. Some friends and I who all work together at the barn decided that we wanted to do something to honor her. So I came up with the idea of putting together a one day event and we could call it Camp Casey. And we would go to the local hospital where she received treatment and we would gather some patients and offer them a day of horseback riding. So on a Saturday in June 2004, I believe, we put together this one-day event, and we called it Camp Casey, and it was a tremendous success. We had over 80 people come out. We rotated these little kids from different horseback riding stations to they could bathe the horse, they could make horse treats, they could do all sorts of really fun things. And then about a week later after the day had come and gone, um, I received a letter from a little boy who was in attendance and he was four and the letter read, thank you for the best day of my life. And I remember just thinking like, well, I guess we can do it again because that really wasn't that hard to pull, to pull off. And it made such a significant impact on this little boy. And I held this event monthly until I graduated. I just kept going back to Camp Casey and about how I wasn't ready to let it go. And I really did get so much pleasure and joy out of seeing the event make a difference in the lives of other people. And so the organization has just completely evolved into what it is today. And I'm so proud that I decided to take that risk because it's completely taken my life in a wild direction. It's just the most fulfilling career that I could ever imagine. And I I just don't see myself ever doing anything else because I just, I love this work so much and I believe wholeheartedly in in its impact. And from one young girl named Casey to a a one-time event for 80 people now as a camp serving uh, between 1,400 and 1,600 uh, individuals uh, a year. That's <laughs> that's an incredible amount of growth. And uh, from what I understand, you're also in the middle of another big growth moment. Can you share a little bit about this current moment? So about a year from right now, we are hoping to be operating in the greater Charleston area. So while it's too cold to operate up north, we are hoping to be operating in the south. And then once it becomes too hot in the south to operate, because I don't know that anyone would want to be uh, outside riding a horse in July in South Carolina, 
that's when the rig will uh, come right back up north and be able to operate in Michigan. So our goal is to um, double the amount of families that we serve by becoming a by um, turning our horsey house call program into a year round program. And we're very proud of this. It's a very exciting time. It's a little bit scary for us because it's a it's a huge financial undertaking, and of course there's some risk whenever we push out a pilot program, but. We're confident that we're ready to do it. We know that the need is there. We know how unique this program is and what a difference it can make in a different area. So um, I'm so proud to see Camp Casey become a national organization uh, in 2019. Congratulations on that. That is that is really exciting. For those who are uh, interested in Camp Casey's mission and would like to find ways to support what you do. Um, what can people do? We'll provide links to the website, of course, uh, in the program notes. But what can people do? Give people a sense of what they can do to help support Camp Casey. So we are always looking for volunteers. Whether you're horse savvy or not, we would love to have you be a part of our program. If you can't volunteer your time, we'd like you to tell somebody about what we do. We're always looking for more families that we can serve. And lastly, and probably, um, you know, sadly, the most important part, we need money. In order to continue doing what we do, we need to be funded properly. Our program is expensive. We require equipment and horses and certifications and insurance. The easiest way to, to contribute is just by making a donation. You can make it in honor of a friend and we will send a really nice tribute card to your friend or loved one. And um, yeah, every penny really does stretch. We operate on a shoestring budget. It costs uh, $350,000 to do what we do annually in Michigan. And um, we we raise all of that and we spend all of it in a calendar year. So we are um, always looking for financial support just to keep us going. And, you know, just doing some quick, uh, real rough math, if there's about 1,600 patients who are served uh, by that $350,000 each year, that's only about 220 bucks per patient for everything that Camp Casey's doing. So And the the um what they get out of this is just incredible. I mean, we are the cowboy campouts. I know we talked very little about the cowboy campouts, but it's a it's a vacation. It's a time away for the families to bond with each other, with their children, with their husband or wife again, you know, since they've not really had a moment to themselves since their child's diagnosis. All of the planning and all of the cost you know, away so they don't have to worry at all about that. They simply have to pack and show up and they're able to um, be surrounded by other families going through similar circumstances in a really peaceful environment where they can just relax and enjoy some time unplugged in a way. Um, That vacation is about a $5,000 vacation that we spend on um, 20 families every summer. So it's donating to Camp Casey is really getting... A, a, a lot of bang for your buck because you're doing a lot of good, helping a very small grassroots nonprofit organization really do a lot of amazing things. All of us here are working, you know, directly from the heart. And uh, we do believe that this organization is very guided and that it's only been able to grow because of the kind of support that we've we've been able to attract. So again, it's Camp Casey, Casey with a C. The website is camp org. Very easy to navigate to find your way around. Uh, we've been speaking with Molly Reeser, the founder and executive director of Camp Casey. Molly, congratulations on everything you've done with this exceptional organization, continued success, and I hope today we helped introduce a few more people to Camp Casey and your mission. Oh, I I so appreciate the opportunity, and I'm excited to hear from all of your listeners and um, get everyone on on board and uh, turn more cowboys and cowgirls, you know, into our to our cause. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. Take care. Bye bye. And just one last time here before we move into parting shots and sign off for this episode, we want to recognize Shire for supporting the Bloodstream podcast. Thank you, Shire, for everything that you do for this community, but especially for supporting. I shouldn't say especially. Thank you most of all for creating life-saving treatments. But thank you right now in this moment, especially for supporting the Bloodstream podcast. As always, thank you, Shire. Thank you, Molly, for sharing with us here on the Bloodstream Podcast. Again, if you'd like to learn more about Camp Casey, which you should, it sounds like a cool place, visit camp-casey.org. Again, that's camp-important-camp-casey, C-A-S-E-Y, 
org. All right, so that will bring us, Natalie, into our final segment today. I already teased my parting shot, which we'll get to here in a moment, but we'll start with you, your parting shot. One thing to leave our audience with, bleeding disorders related or otherwise, for the month of March, March 19th, 2018, what is your parting shot? Well, this is March 19th. Um. <laughs> <laughs> And the <laughs> so um St. Patty's Day just passed. Yeah. But way before that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Were you just like reminding us? <laughs> yeah, I'm just bringing us up in the calendar. Okay, thanks. All right, good. <laughs> uh so this will have been a, a couple of weeks now, but we did watch the Oscars together. Oh, and yeah, Patrick yeah. and I played this really fun game, having not really <laughs> seen any of the movies. You're not supposed to tell people that. I'm supposed to be a little bit in entertainment. Okay, uh, we've seen some of the movies, but oh, this year we were not that good. No, we weren't. Um, but we still played this game that we'd guess <laughs> yeah. who the winner would be from like the small clips and, and our uh, general knowledge of... Yeah, a little finger on the pulse kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and then... If you got three right in a row, then you had to give the other person a massage. Shout, shout out Aunt Teresa and Uncle Gene for uh, telling us about this game. Two of our podcast listeners. <laughs> <laughs> and um, family members. So, yeah. Um, Patrick got a lot right. I crushed it. He crushed it. He really, yeah. yeah, he crushed it. Mm -hmm. So I was like massaging for a while and then I got one right. And then um, he was generous enough to to give me a massage even though I, I didn't quite hit the quota. But anyways, it was fun. It was uh you know, it was nice to watch that together, and I'm sure a lot of you tuned in, and it was a good award show this year. It was. Yeah, it yeah. was a good award show. Um, so, that's my parting shot. I like Just it. Just you know, a comment on... Uh, build on build games around events you watch that connect you and your partner on more intimate levels. <laughs> <laughs> that's what or we're offering here. Or just get, you know, free massage. Say goodbye. <laughs> or that. Or just get a free massage, Yeah. <laughs> Or just like do the puppy eyes enough that, that your partner goes, oh, okay, and you just get one <laughs> like, anyway. Like, please, I'm not good at this game. <laughs> but yeah, so that's my parting shot. And uh, on, on to you for your parting shot this month. Uh, my parting shot for this week. So one of the people that we were actually staying with um, at the De La Riva's house in Houston was Lori Kelly, who is the founder of Save One Life, um, which, you know, you heard a little bit about what Barry um what he contributed to them. And she was also a, a very close personal friend of Barry's, um, sharing some stories with me while we were together. Um, but she published something uh, just this past, well, recently, I'll say, uh, about Barry. And it's actually something that he sent her that she doesn't believe was published anywhere else. So she shared it with all of us. And I'm just going to read what she had to say about it. And then I'm going to read the piece itself. And um, we'll leave you on that note. Um, this month. So I'll say now that thanks for listening. You know the deal, bloodstreammedia.com for the links. Mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com if you want to tell us anything. As always, thank you to everybody involved in making this happen. Thanks, of course, to Shire for supporting this and making this possible. Um, enjoy this piece, and we will see you next month. Remembering the Rain, Barry Hardy. So this opening bit is from Lori Kelly. I don't know if this was ever published anywhere, but my dear late friend Barry Hardy sent this to me shortly after we met. It expressed to me the depths of his soul, his feelings, compassion, caring, and his pain. Barry loved jazz and played it professionally. He said it was considered one of the highest forms of music. He was an incredibly intelligent man with a heart of gold and a sensitive spiritual soul. And he was apparently an excellent writer. This essay is about love, our community, pain, and longing. Read it, or listen to it, and think of Barry. The title comes from a beautiful song by jazz player Bill Evans on a CD Barry gave me as a gift. Remembering the Rain by Barry Hardy. Why do you ignore me? Asked the pretty girl with lustrous black hair and the dark and wounded eyes, eyes that had captured my imagination from the very first time she'd greeted me and sweetly asked my name. I know something must have happened to you, she said. Why won't you talk to me? It was the fall of 1990, and I had met someone special. She loved to dance and sing, and had aspirations of a career in the theater. We'd met while performing in a musical production together. I played the trombone from the relative seclusion and anonymity afforded by the orchestra pit, while she practiced her craft under the bright lights of center stage. She was everything I was not unabashedly extroverted and brimming with the passions of youth and the hopeful expectations of what she dreamed her life would become. I didn't answer her questions. 
How could I tell her that I had been recently diagnosed with HIV, a dreaded disease that was rapidly spreading and killing hundreds of thousands around the globe, creating an unstoppable wave of hysterical fear, panic, and prejudice in its wake? I was already having a bad time of it in the summer of 1990. My brother-in-law had just succumbed to a long and arduous battle with AIDS, which he contracted from the same blood products I had used to control bleeding caused by my hemophilia. We were told the medications were safe. They weren't. I still recall Pat's memorial service. Friends and family gathered in the usual way as they inevitably do at such times. Condolences were offered and pleasantries exchanged. Most of those in attendance were aware that they were attending the funeral of an AIDS victim, but the word AIDS was carefully and meticulously skirted, as if a diaphanous veil of tacit silence had descended over the whole affair. I sat next to my brother John, also a hemophiliac and also HIV positive. My brother was very strong, and I had never seen him cry. I silently wondered if the same thought occupied his mind, which of us would be the next to die. The answer came 17 years later when John lost his battle with hepatitis C, that other virus with which we had also been infected. His HIV status was never mentioned at his funeral either. I had personally insisted on it. 1990 was also the year Ryan White died. I had watched for several years as the story of the White family was told and retold in the mass media. Ryan's life symbolized the plight of many AIDS victims at the time. He was denied the right to attend school and forced to move from his neighborhood after someone fired a bullet into the window of the White's family home. Audiences around the globe watched his story unfold in front of the seemingly endless number of reporters who took up residence on the street where Ryan lived, hoping to catch a glimpse of the new poster boy for AIDS. Ryan's remarkable bravery and his long struggle with hemophilia and AIDS ended with his death on April 8th of that unbearable year. While Ryan White's life was highly publicized and often sensationalized in the media, his story was by no means unique. I'd seen other stories in the news, like that of the Ray family, whose home was firebombed and burned to the ground by belligerent neighbors simply because they feared the three young Ray brothers who were hemophiliacs living with AIDS. They didn't want them in their schools. I later learned of a young man named Robbie who lived in rural Kentucky. Robbie had been born with hemophilia, but he was in school and had dreams of becoming a minister. When his HIV status was exposed, Robbie received threats. People in their town said they were going to string him up from the nearest tree. Robbie and his mother moved in the dead of night to another town only to encounter prejudice and bigotry once again, including from the pastor of his new church who demanded that Robbie hang a sign around his neck disclosing his HIV status to others. Robbie had unknowingly infected his fiancee with HIV. She died of AIDS at age 21. Robbie never became a minister. He became ill with complications from AIDS, and alone, except for his mother who was then dying of cancer, he ended his life by means of a fatal gunshot to the head. How was I to tell the object of my youthful affections that my life was composed of such stories? A life of experiences I felt certain she could never understand. How could I explain the fate that had befallen so many in the hemophilia community, many of whom were merely children, how could I tell her that I lived with the same disease that had silenced the lives of thousands of others and that had propelled many of those lives into a reality often defined by secrecy and quiet desperation? To these, life had come quickly and gone, leaving not bitterness, but pity, not disillusion, but only pain. I yearned to tell my terrible secret, but never did. Years later, I tried to locate her, but to no avail. I wanted to explain it, you see, to make it right, to make some sense of it somehow. I am left now with only memories. A memory of something hoped for, something that might have been, but wasn't. The memory of a love, once discovered and lost, never to be relived again. And a memory of the day we said goodbye. I really do love you, I whispered as I embraced her for the last time and bid her farewell. You don't love me, she said dispassionately as she turned and walked away. Our paths had parted now, and I was certain we would not meet again. The skies began to darken and a weary stillness settled in the air. 
I lingered for a moment beneath the sprawling oak tree which had shaded us while we'd sat and talked one day while exchanging expectant glances into one another's eyes. A sudden gust of wind claimed the last of its withering leaves, casualties of the inevitable arrival of winter. Absent now were the familiar mocking birds that no longer gathered and sang from amongst its gray and barren branches. I drove away slowly in the midst of a cold but gently falling rain, the windshield wipers beating out their own curious accompaniment to a long forgotten tune which echoed faintly from the radio. Maybe I should have said, Maybe I should have saved those leftover dreams. Funny, but here's that rainy day. Here's that rainy day they told me about. And I laughed at the thought that it might turn out this way. Where is that worn out wish I threw aside after it brought my love so near? Funny how love becomes a cold rainy day. Funny that rainy day is here.